Your Excellencies, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, may I too begin by saying what a privilege it is for me to have this opportunity to speak to you this afternoon. I'd like to thank the Indian Foundation and partner institutions for organising this prestigious and important event, and of course, the wonderful Maldives for hosting it. The Indian Ocean is an area of great interest to all of our nations, and to me personally, in my role as the UK Commander of Combined Task Force 150, a coalition maritime security force charged with delivering security in the Indian Ocean region. We're part of the Combined Maritime Forces, which are a 33-nation coalition of like-minded nations committed to security in the maritime domain. Now, as a naval officer, unlike some other distinguished delegates here I see, the sea has been my life, both on it and under it. But the sea is also the lifeblood and vital artery for commerce, trade, and economy. Nowhere is this more true than in the Indian Ocean, which sits at the crossroads of international trade, that critical link between the world's economic powerhouses of the Euro-Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific regions. Yesterday and today, we have heard from numerous renowned speakers about the prominence and prestige of the Indian Ocean, so I will not cover all ground, suffice to say, it's important for so many reasons to so many nations here represented. The Indian Ocean is more than simply a transit corridor. It's a populated littoral zone, has areas of significant rapid economic growth in their own right. Growth underpinned by rich natural resources found in the huge expanse that is the Indian Ocean. But forgive me to coin a phrase, all is not plain sailing. Substantial threats to this legitimate and prosperous activity endure. The everyday expansive and legal activity of trade, fishing and leisure is diametrically opposed by those who seek to use the sea for unlawful purposes. Malign activity comes in many forms and guises, with non-state actors engaged in the smuggling of arms, people and narcotics, either to further their own ill-gotten gains or fuel terrorism and violent extremism that threaten our livelihood and prosperity. Using the innocent to disguise their nefarious activity and exploiting the freedom of the sea, the perpetrators have also resorted to piracy with no regard for international law. Whilst piracy has reduced since its peak in 2010, mostly due to the consistent patrolling by many of those nations represented here today, it is suppressed, not eradicated. It will not take a great deal of effort for piracy to re-emerge should maritime forces fail to provide that level of deterrence. The maritime security challenge is further compounded by the increase in trade, largely owing to globalization and mass migration from unstable countries and the ever-present spectre of natural disasters. I think it's fair to say that the Indian Ocean is contested, congested and complicated. The technological developments to promote security, governance, prosperity and sustainability that we leverage are also available to our adversaries. They too have become smarter. While the fourth industrial revolution allows us all to conduct our business in a more interconnected, agile and global manner, it also offers the same level of technology to those that would wish to do us harm in the most complex of manners, all of which are plausibly deniable and virtually untraceable. So we need to embrace technology in the maritime domain, making sure we understand the impact of the latest developments, and we need to drive science and technology to the heart of everything we do, which will enable us to stay ahead of the curve. Simply put, we need to be innovative, imaginative and inventive to enhance our ability to combat these varied and complex threats. The UK in this context is a global leader, answering tomorrow's problems today through our technical expertise. But the threat I have described cannot be countered by one single entity or nation. We all have a keen interest in ensuring that the important economies which this area serves are protected from those unwanted shocks. I offer that we're all responsible for suppressing and wherever possible, stamping out malign activity 
that is interwoven in our daily fabric. On protecting security, we all have a shared interest in ensuring we protect the free flow of legitimate trade across the ocean and protecting that trade from maritime crime, including piracy and the tracking, so again, the trafficking of illicit goods. As a UK commander of CTF 150, I am personally responsible for the coalition task group that seeks to stifle illegal maritime activity on the high seas that can also fund terrorism, a destable activity destabilize activity for all of our nations. To combat some of these threats, we need a meeting of minds and a sharing of maritime domain awareness and support to third country capacity building to promote our mutual prosperity and deny the use of this vital artery by those who seek to promote their malign activities. But again, no one country can take on this task alone, which is why we must cooperate and build those are sustainable regional and international networks to ensure that the free flow of commerce can continue unimpeded. The Combined Maritime Forces, which I'm very much part of and indeed proud of, is an enduring partnership of 33 willing nations, all with a common purpose to provide security and stability by conducting maritime security operations to hinder that malign non-state actor activity. Our area of operations covers 3.2 million square miles, which includes the Indian Ocean, the Red Sea, and Gulf of Aden, to name but a few. As the UK commander of 150, I work with the other maritime commanders and teams from my partner nations to have a stabilizing effect throughout the region. We build upon the diversity of our strengths, our varied experiences and expertise, our cultures, and the assets we can offer to the cause to improve maritime security in the region. We have a member nation from every inhabited continent on Earth, working together to a common goal. With a non-political mandate, nations are able to volunteer to conduct maritime security operations in line with their individual capacities and national permissioning to ensure that we are ready together. To achieve this, we have three task forces. 150I Command is responsible for maritime security and counterterrorism. 151 currently commanded by the Republic of Korean Navy, is responsible for counter-piracy operations within our area of responsibility. And 152 is currently commanded by the Royal Jordanian Navy, which is responsible for maritime security in the Arabian Gulf, as well as building cooperation between regional nations and wider CMF. The activities of these forces are all coordinated by CMF headquarters based in the US Naval Support Facility in Bahrain. Our assets remain ready to respond to a number of number of other events at sea, which could include humanitarian and environmental crises. Even with this coalition of this scope and reach, we do not work in isolation. CMF achieves those results by working together, pooling those resources and actively supporting regional maritime forces patrolling their own maritime environment. We work incredibly closely with the EU Naval Forces Operation Atalanta, whose headquarters are currently based in Rhodes, Spain. We also coordinate and deconflict our counter piracy efforts with other nations operating independently in the region, including India and China, to more effectively protect the internationally recognized transit corridor, or the IRTC, as it's more commonly known in the Gulf of Aden. This broad collaboration has ensured a constant presence of warships suppressing piracy, but let's not forget the Somali pirates retain that capability and intent to conduct attacks. And in fact, there were two unsuccessful attacks in April of this year off the Horn of Africa. All those transiting in the high-risk area should continue to abide by the industry guidance freely available in the best management practice currently at Edition 5. But it's not only continued piracy which CMF is tackling. In the last 12 months, CMF has seized more narcotics than ever before. And just for some data, in 2017, we seized 11 tonnes. In 2018, 60 tonnes. And this year already, 47 tonnes. This year's projections indicate there will likely be another increase in the proliferation of narcotics. Owing to the sheer size of the area over which smuggling occurs and the desire by smugglers to keep their activities secret, counter-trafficking is a very difficult assignment for a maritime force of any size. However, owing to our unique ability to pool resource, 
to share information and coordinate response, we have proven our ability to maximise that return on investment of particip participating nations. Complementing the work that CMF undertakes, some member states acting in a national capacity and independently engaging with regional partners are seeking to address the issue of a legal finish. By that I mean a practical, legal and tangible conclusion to the maritime operations and interdictions, similar to what you heard yesterday from the Minister in the Seychelles, Her Excellency McSusie Mondo. Such a finish, if constructed appropriately, could disable the means through which entities engage in malign activity and could also provide that single decisive deterrent to those considering embarking upon on such activities. This is key to ensuring that these criminal and by extension terrorist networks are effectively disrupted beyond the interdiction of a single shipment. I invite you to consider the proposition that the arrest of criminals, the seizure of vessels and the steady erosion of our adversaries' potential to wreak their havoc can offer a truly effective tonic to this ailment. However, any negotiations, potential agreements and treaties which are ratified as a result are a matter for individual nations to develop and pursue in line with their legal and constitutional frameworks. But one can surely envisage the practical benefits of such endeavours. But what about the UK? The UK has recognised the challenges and threats posed in the Indian Ocean that have combined to put a demand signal in the Royal Navy for a continued presence in the region. Whether that's on national tasking, working on a bilateral basis, or under multilateral frameworks like the combined maritime forces I've spoken about. The Royal Navy has a permanent presence in the Indian Ocean region through the UK Maritime Component Command, based in Bahrain, which is responsible for the Royal Navy's contribution to maritime security in the region. Here, we coordinate and lead the combined efforts of UK warships, aircraft, and over 1,000 deployed naval personnel in our joint operating area that stretches from the Red Sea to the Arabian Gulf and the Indian Ocean as far south as Tanzania. Throughout this area, we maintain UK warships at sea 365 days a year, and we also contribute officers in key leadership positions like the Deputy Commander of CMF, the Commander of 150, and the Chief of Staff to 151, amongst many others. We're also delighted to be one of the first nations to be joining India's Information Fusion Centre, and we look forward to our liaison officer joining soon. On the diplomatic stage, we're opening a new UK mission in the Maldives later this month. Karen Rossler will be the head of mission, who was the head of mission in the Seychelles and knows the region well. She is our blue economy environmental expert. In 2018, with the kind support of the Kingdom of Bahrain, the UK opened a permanent naval support facility, which enabled us to be more agile in supporting our deployed assets and personnel. And in the same year, HMS Dragon's deployment to the West Indian Ocean resulted in eight drug seizures of 18 tons of narcotics with a street value of $200 million. We continue to work in deterrence and disruption of this illegal activity. This year, we have forward-based a Type 23 frigate, HMS Montrose, for three years to drive greater productivity and efficiency in operational outputs in the region. She arrived in Bahrain in April and has been busy conducting maritime security operations. Alongside this, Type 45 destroyers currently deployed to Gulf, and a further frigate, HMS Ken and destroyer HMS Defender, have deployed from the UK and will all leave HMS Duncan next week. We've announced we've joined the International Maritime Security Construct. Now, this mission is the international response to reassure the shipping industry and deter further attacks in light of the immediate threat to freedom of navigation. We're delighted to see Australia join the IMSC, and we'd like to see other nations join this shared approach to maintaining our collective security. Merchant ships must be free to travel lawfully and trade safely anywhere. This demonstrates our commitment to the maintenance of maritime security across the region, and by working together, greatly enhances our ability to operate across the Indian Ocean. Thanks also to our close relationship with the Sultan of Oman, we have committed to use Dukham in Oman as a regional training and logistics hub, including the future use 
of our new Queen Elizabeth class aircraft carriers. From these locations, we are uniquely poised to conduct operations and look to strengthen our partnerships and interoperability by taking part in exercises with regional forces. And so in closing, I'd like to make the following observations. I think we'd all agree the prominence of the Indian Ocean can never be understated. As far back as the 13th century, when Marco Polo set out to explore East Asia, nations had already been exchanging their wares for thousands of years using the monsoon winds of the Indian Ocean. Today, that ocean still hosts that vital trade and links to civilization, but it is far more densely populated, contested, and exploited by malign actors who would wish to challenge the rules-based order and everyday norms in the maritime domain. Their persistence and avarice knows no bounds, and therefore, the need for successful maritime security operations across the Indian Ocean region to permit access to lawful actors, disrupt malfeasance, and protect the free flow of commerce will endure. As I have said, it's imperative we continue to look for innovative, imaginative, and inventive ways to work in partnership and friendship with you all to grow our economies and protect our national security. Your security is our security too. So both the UK and CMF are fully committed to the enduring task of conducting maritime security operations in the region. And we welcome all nations who share a common interest to join us. Indeed, our relationships have a proven success in deterrence and countering of illicit activity in our areas of operation. And I, for one, have been hugely encouraged by the open and honest debate in this conference, which will hope to build on our joint successes so far. Thank you.